local neighborhoods resist planning applications for mosques, and we win. But with the help of my colleague, Hans, we're going to be expanding into Europe as well. Now, we started doing it out of a sense of duty. There wasn't much encouragement, I have to be honest. The figure that I've heard is that since 1979, the Saudi government alone has sunk over $200 billion into mosques and madrasas in Western countries. So, me just starting this on my own, it didn't look promising, but we win, and we want the same for you. Now, plenty of people try to censor me. Since we're talking about the OIC, I'll tell you my approach to people who try to censor me. Unprofessional counsellors and unprincipled journalists, and on top of that, self righteous community organisers. We can picture that kind of individual. They want to censor me, and I have to tell you that their abuse is about the most enjoyable part of the work I do. <laughs> I'm not sure I can continue without the encouragement and good cheer that they provide. So, Mark Stein, present an award to them for, for, for what they do for our project, I would be very grateful. That is, journalists, community organisers and unprofessional counsellors. I think there's a while before we're doing that though. But we don't debate with such people, we turn the tides on them. Sorry, we turn the tables on them. And that is what we should suggest you do with the OIC. Don't get caught debating them about censorship. It's as tedious as watching a plank wall. And also, I don't like the odds. They only have to win once to shut down free speech for good. We have to win every time. Now, I would rather debate the beardy OIC representative on how many Kalashnikovs he's got hidden under his bloated maternity dress than debate censorship with him. I don't like the odds. Let them know that Islam will be the first in the census crosshairs, okay? And you will soon find that Islam is a free boost in libertarian ideology and that your local Islam is a cross between Voltaire and George Orwell. Now, we don't need a censor in order to do this. It's a straightforward public order issue because propagating Islamic doctrine in a free society is contrary to law. And I'll say that again. In a free society, propagating Islamic doctrine is contrary to civil and criminal law. The Quran alone, forget about the, the Hadith, the Quran alone calls three times for unbelievers, that's us, to be killed wherever we are found, and, and all your families as well. Kill them wherever you find them. It calls 14 times for unbelievers to be enslaved, usually sex slaves taken in conquest. It calls numerous times for unbelievers to, have, uh, to be made war against, to be subjugated for harshness against unbelievers. In language that is reminiscent of the language used by Reinhard Heydrich, the chief henchman of the Holocaust, in his last will and testament. The language is strikingly similar. Now, uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand why that's unacceptable, why that is unlawful. Imagine a bunch of SS guys saying, we want to set up a chapter house, somewhere where we can stand in lines, wear our city caps, sawn off trousers, and listen to incitement from our leader's book about killing Jews and gays. They would be shut down in a minute flat, and they should be. No society that allows that will survive. It can't survive if it allows that, and it should. No one will have any, any respect, any sympathy for it when it fails to survive. And the same is true if you're a bunch of Muslim guys, if a bunch of Muslim guys want to set up a chapter house where they can wear their silly caps and sawn off trousers and stand in lines listening to incitement from their, their, their leader's book about killing Jews and gays. Now, ordinary people get this. Politically correct people deny that they get it, but they get it. Hence, their nonsense about the religion of peace and the tiny minority. They know it's not the case. The one thing I've learned from doing this is that our councillors, our leaders, they know what they're creating. Sorry. They know what they're creating. They're in a position to know. And they, they know what's coming. At one uh, very angry meeting, I was escorted out by four policemen, one in front, one behind, one either side, and, and a senior councillor leading me up by the hand. And I thought to myself, it would be rude not to talk to this gentleman. He's holding my hand, I'll talk to him. So I said, it was you I feel sorry for. And he said, what do you mean? I said, it's only going to get worse. And, uh, and he said, well, I know. And I thought, you cheap individual. I said, what are you going to do when it all explodes? And he said, I'll be long retired by then. They, he didn't challenge me. They know, they, they know what's coming, and, and, and they, 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 uh, they, they should do. But Western nations got this centuries before they discovered multiculturalism. 
the foundational documents of English law. That's Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, Common Law, also the Declaration of Independence, and the American Constitution. These are all founded on the principle of public order, on the idea that you have public peace. It's referred to as the peace, public peace, or the king's peace in those documents. Now, if you doubt the wisdom of those people, going back almost a century, then just try enforcing your right, your fundamental right to religious diversity in Somalia. It's a nonsense. You won't get anywhere. There's no one, there's no one to enforce it. Now, I know what you may be thinking. You may be thinking, this is, good. This is too hard line. You've got to show your soft side. You've got to be ameliorative if you want to get anywhere, if you want to persuade people, if you want to win. No. Wrong answer. Look at the evidence. Now, we have fought 13 campaigns resisting mosque applications, stopping mosques getting built. And we have won all 13 of those. All 13 occasions. <laughs> On 13 occasions, the application has either been withdrawn or it has been with, uh, refused. And that's 13 neighbourhoods that have a chance now. We've got them some time. They may be able to hold out. And we didn't do it by soft peddling on Islam. We didn't do it by sucking up to these strange, smooth shaven, glad handing, gigolo figures. Mosque organisations always choose to front their, their, their mosque applications. I don't know why, but they do. We didn't do it by sucking up to them. We do it in two ways. First of all, we let local authorities know you have got no more right to grant planning permission for this application than you have the power to grant me a bent garage for selling stolen cars out to the public. You can't do that. You have no power to do that. You have no power to grant planning permission for this. Secondly, we tell them, if you do that, if you assist something that is outside the law, you could wind up under investigation yourself when the law is once again applied even-handedly. Aiding and abetting is an offence, and you had better look out because you may be held to account, not by some mob, not by me, but by the law. In effect, we tell them, you be certain what you do. You be certain what you fear. And you be certain you don't fear the results of this because you might find yourself across a courtroom facing a lawyer. And when the politically correct fog has been cleared away, has been blown away, it will reveal a lot of eyes staring hard at you. Now, what does winning mean? What do we mean by that? Ultimately, that means Islam going where fascism and communism. It means the shrines of Islam going the way of Lenin's shrine. It means the benighted Islamic countries that labour under the Islamic religion eventually become regretting their Islamic past and celebrating being free from it. Now we may not see live to see that come to fruition, but we can live to see to see it get underway. How? What is the method? How do you achieve that? Well the main method is by using pushing at the open, the programming back door that the Islamic program has left in that Islamic source code. It's said that every program, computer program, has a back door that the program is legal. Now that back door into the Islamic computer program is this association between religious adherence and worldly success. If you are an orthodox hardline Muslim, you will achieve more, uh, you'll have more worldly success, more tributes, more money, more slaves, more sex. Uh, and if you break that, break that link, and you will find that people will gradually peel away from Islam. Establish the principle, which again, everyone understands, that you reap what you sow. And then Islam, which reaps so much harm and so little good, even to its believers, will reap its own, so it sows so much harm and so little good, will reap its own demise. In the meantime, my advice is to hold the line. We are going to hold the line on what you're doing. The current crop of politically correct, pandering, self-serving leaders won't be there forever. I could improve on their attempts to chop off the branch which they're sitting on. Hold the line on decency. Now our leaders, are, they're, they're boiling up a very unpleasant witch's brew of, of, of fiscal breakdown, welfare implosion, and hostile ethnic division. When that bubbles over, there will be some nasty things happening and we should resist them. In particular, and the touchstone 
is that we should resist everywhere the persecution of Jews. Not one Jewish person should feel under threat from any quarter. That is a touchstone. If, if you can hold to that one, to that side, you will probably avoid doing any harm in the bad years that are going to come. And finally, hold the line on the law. Use the law. Use it to turn the tables on the opposition. It may be tempting, and there are people on this stage who have every reason not to respect the law. I'm not sure the names of this, but people have every, every incentive not to respect the law. But if, if you try to short circuit the law through disorder, you will regret it. One day the law will be applied even handedly, and we will win. Thank you. My name is Gary.